So my title is People Get Ready, uh, Prophetic Practical Theology as Public Theology. In the 40th chapter of Isaiah, we read these words, A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. In this week before the beginning of Advent, I want to share some tentative thoughts about the future of public theology. First, by exploring an understanding of the prophetic vocation of theology, and then going on to ask what is implied by that in terms of preparing the way. So let me make two things clear at the outset. First, that I do understand that no one with any self-awareness should ever claim to be prophetic. Second, that I do have a little self-awareness, and I am not claiming to be prophetic. And if we're all clear on that, let me now contradict myself by saying this. I think all theologians are called to be prophetic. And being aware of that calling and trying to be obedient to it is not a problem, thinking we have attained it probably is. When I speak about the prophetic, I have three things in mind which are all very simple, if extremely hard to put into practice. First of all, doing and or seeing what God is calling us to do or say in a particular time and place. Secondly, the preparation and learning necessary for us to do that. And thirdly, the attentiveness and response to God's call which comes before this. We might see these simple ideas as what goes to make up the prophetic ordinary, asking what the Lord requires of us in our place and time. Church people do this, I would suggest, in sermons and in Bible studies. I think Sunday sermons should be a key site for the prophetic ordinary. An Advent Sunday what it's called to be awake, to be alert, to be woke, is particularly important. A planned disruption of ordinary time, which asks with particular intensity and insistence if we are ready, which reminds us of the need to get ready for God who has come, who is coming now, and who will come. In her 2013 book on the future of public theology, Between a Rock and a Hard Place, Elaine Graham points us to a vision of public theology as a lived apologetic. The inspiration for our being here today is the faithful witness, the prophetic work, sometimes as a voice in the wilderness, and the lived apologetic of Duncan Forrester. Like so many here, I am profoundly in his debt. One of his last projects was the book we edited together on liturgy and worship, a world-famous theologian graciously working with an unknown career young academic, guiding and advising and mentoring. I interviewed Duncan for my PhD and wrote a chapter in that about him and CTPI. And after he died, I thought back to what I knew of his life, uh, from his writings in particular, and twice in the past year, I've reflected on that with doctoral students in practical theology, both in Glasgow and in Durham. And I'm only going to give you the briefest three-minute version of that here. But Jolly, and you could be my beautiful assistant for this, actually. Um, so I want to do this through a series of dates and decades. In 1939, Duncan was aged six. He writes, from my parents in the Gutman area, which was when Jewish Christian refugees stayed with the Forrester family in St. Andrews. From my parents in the Gutman era of our family life, I picked up a deep conviction that there was such a thing as radical evil which must be resisted. 1949. Duncan is aged 16. The year before had witnessed the creation of the National Health Service. Nye Bevan unveiled uh, the, the beginning of the National Health Service and stated that Britain now had the moral leadership of the world. 1959, the new college years. In those days in the churches in Scotland and elsewhere, a deep euphoria. It was almost as if World War II had vindicated the claims and the authority of Jesus Christ against the blasphemous project of Adolf Hitler. 1969, Duncan is in India and writes of, this is a time of culture shock. 
the intensity of visible poverty. And over and over again in his writings, he returns to conversations with Munaswamy, the man who begged on the bridge, and his question about whether he and Munaswamy could be neighbors. 1979, Duncan has arrived here. The first devolution referendum, the fall of the Callaghan government, and the beginning of the Thatcher years. 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall and a symbolic crisis of the European left. In between these two dates, we'd had the creation of CTPI. 1999, Duncan's still here at New College, the arrival of the Scottish Parliament, his own retirement eminent. He wins the Templeton Prize. He's lived through the wilderness years, if you like, of the Thatcher era, and he's now in the middle of the Blair Brown years. 2009, he's now emeritus professor. He's writing about theology and fragments, the beginnings of failing health. Obama, an African American, has been elected US president, and we're in the twilight of the Blair Brown era. And then 2019, which of course lies ahead of us. And the last slide carries the rest of what I want to say. If Duncan's life was in its own way, and he would be the first to say in its own flawed way, if it was by the grace of God a lived apologetic, then his friend and staunch admirer Stanley Harvass would urge us to learn from it. The Gutman era marked him with an awareness of radical evil. As a teenager, he was thrilled and inspired by the creation of the NHS and the welfare state. In India, he was confronted by acute poverty. When I read his work, and I've read almost everything he ever wrote, strangely apart from his PhD, um, these experiences and the studies which accompanied and followed them into political science and liberation theology combined to prepare him for a significant prophetic challenge which I suggest came particularly in 1979. That first Edinburgh decade saw Duncan emerge as one of the key theological opponents of Thatcherism, one of the key theological critics of monetarism, and one of the key theological defenders of the welfare state. In Duncan's life, I think we see how the idea of the prophetic is at the heart of public theology, which must always have a strong contemporary edge, the ability to engage with what is happening now. But that ability depends on our being ready to speak when the moment comes, and that readiness depends on preparation. The future of public theology, in fact, depends on the work we are already doing now. Luke 18, 8, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? In academic terms, it depends on PhD choices, on the calls of founding councils and trusts, on hiring policies in divinity schools, on program planning by a CTI or a CTPI, on wise prophetic guidance from supervisors. It depends on book pitches and grant applications and plans for research leave. It means for the church and the theological community that we need people to help us to be ready. None of us can work on everything. So from the side of Christian theology, I thank God that we have decades of work by Michael Northcott to shape our prophetic response to climate change. That we have the work of scholars from Phyllis Tribble through to Leslie Orr to inform those of us, including I know both myself and my colleague Heather who have preached on the Me Too campaign against sexual harassment in recent weeks. That we have the work of scholars like Susanna Cornwall paying serious attention to emerging issues around gender and sexuality. That we have a David Clough who's writing on animal rights. That we have insightful new voices like that of Joshua Ralston reflecting on Christian Muslim relationships and Leah Robinson on sectarianism and reconciliation. And that in the era of I, Daniel Blake, we still have the work and legacy and example of Duncan Forrester to guide and inform our thinking about welfare and the welfare state. We need each other and we need to value one another's work. We need a diverse ecology of theological research and output to be preparing the future of public theology today, 
to help us and all God's people to get ready. Finally, from Duncan's example, two other things. One which was disruptive of his project and one which was perhaps one of his blind spots. First, the events around 1989 significantly disrupted the impact and influence of liberation theology in Europe and North America. And I think that had a profound effect on how Duncan had wanted to see the theological agenda change into the 1990s. Secondly, on the events of 1979 and 1999 in Scotland, Duncan's work was at its best addressing how the British state might work for equality and against poverty. As a political theologian, he was strangely quiet on constitutional questions at a time when there was an urgent need for theologians in Scotland to respond to them. And yes, well, and then others of us took on that mantle, but even so, it seems strange looking back. Finally, and very briefly, we have to think over these two days both about what might disrupt our plans and about what we are not ready for and what we can do about it. So here's a couple of suggestions. The theological workforce in England is bigger and more diverse than in Scotland, and yet I saw few signs that theology in England, English theologians, and Anglican theologians were at all ready for the debates around Brexit. More generally, I want to suggest they have not done nearly enough work on constitutional questions, including those around the monarchy. We've had the extraordinary sight this week of people saying that, that Meghan Markle will not be called princess because she does not have royal blood. A rabbi and thought for the day saying she was courageous to admit that she had an African-American mother. And a suggestion almost of misogynation going on in her marrying into the royal family. Surely we want to hear some English and Scottish theologians speaking out about that. There's not been enough work around the monarchy, the House of Lords, the establishment of the Church of England, or the future of English identity. Not unrelated to that, theology across the UK remains relatively weak in responding to issues of ethnicity and racism. We have too few tenured and promoted black theologians and too few programs focused around these questions in our universities. I could go on. Theology and economics and public policy, questions of migration, food and farming, where are the people doing serious work on these questions? I'll stop because I've bound, I'm bound to have missed the one which is at the top of your list. My last word is this. The future of public theology depends on work we are doing or not doing, planning or not planning, here and now. People get ready because there are many trains coming at us and our prophetic task is to look down the track and see what is coming. Thank you.